So today I'm going to be preaching on the topic, Godlessness in the Last Days. And we've been in this series for a long time now called War in the Heavens. It started at the beginning of the year and it'll be concluding rather soon um, after this particular message. We've got a few weeks left and then we're going to get into uh, concluding the series in the book of Revelation. So I'm pretty excited about it. The next few weeks are really, really good stuff. So I hope you keep coming back and that you invite some others to join you as well. Let's go ahead and pray and get into God's word. Father, we thank you and praise you. Your presence was here this morning. We got to spend time with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, worshiping you, exalting your name through song, and now we get to do so through the preaching of your word. We pray, O Lord, that you would give us eyes to see and ears that would hear exactly what you want to speak to each of us today, and even more so, would you give us the power to put your word into practice in our everyday lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So do we live in the last days? That's going to be a big part of the question that we have today. Mary Jo and I took a a little trip for our anniversary. We only went over there to Jacksonville Beach and we stayed a few days at the beach. It was a really fun time for us. Got to get get away, uh, just her and I. And one of the things that I noticed during that season at the beach was that the waves at that day were really kind of crashing in just one after another. And even for a Florida boy, it was not too fun to go out there and get in the water for very long because you'd go out just a little bit and it would knock you over. And as I was sitting there and thinking about many of the things that we've been going through over these past year and a half, two years, with all the changes that we've seen, God gave me that analogy of, man, it's like those waves just crashing one after another, relentlessly one thing after another. And I don't know if you felt the same way, but isn't life that way sometimes? Just one wave comes in and hits you and about knocks you over, and then another one comes. And you're like, please stop, and then boom, another one comes, right? It's a little bit like the day and age in which we live in that God describes in his word. You know, we live in a time where the whole world seems upside down. There's political turmoil, there's natural disasters, there's pestilences like COVID-19. Everybody seems to be hating everybody. And I'm just talking about the Christians. We haven't even got to the secular world out there just yet. Come on, Jesus. When you listen to the news, you don't even have the ability to barely distinguish between truth and lie. You don't know what to believe because it seems like everything is so twisted. We even live in a day and age where Christian speech and beliefs is often considered hate speech in our generation. It's a strange day and age. I was talking for a little while with a man who was 74 years old, and I've been having this kind of conversation with some of the elders in my life. My dad just turned 83 not long ago as well. And I'm like, Dad, have you ever seen anything in your lifetime like what we've been going through? He's like, no, man, the politics is crazier than it's ever been. The pestilences are crazier than it's ever been. The people are crazier than they've ever been, right? And we kind of have a couple alternatives. We could either turtle up and hide out, or maybe God's calling us to something different. And I think as we examine God's word, and we're going to turn in just a second to 2 Timothy, if you have your Bibles with you today, I encourage you to go there. We're going to read from the beginning in 2 Timothy chapter 1, and we're going to flow through various parts of that book and today's message. But what you see is Paul's preaching to this young Timothy, and he tells him the kind of life that he should live. And then he goes on to describe a day and age that's a dark day and age. And how he concludes at the end, how could you live in the midst of that time? So that's a little bit of the format that I'm going to use today, talking to us about life as we know it as believers, the day and age we live in, and then wrap it around at the end of how should we be living in light of the fact that these these days we live in may be the last days, right? So 2 Timothy chapter 2 starts with Paul telling him to guard the deposit entrusted to him. 2 Timothy 1.6, for this reason I remind you to flan the fame, flame of the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of hands. For God gave us a spirit not of fear but of power and of love and of self-control. During the first service, um, John, Pastor John from Guyana was here and uh, it was great to spend my last day worshiping with him here because he knew that he knew and he got up on the stage and he said, um, I'm not leaving necessarily because I want to, I'm leaving and going back to Guyana because I have to. 
And he elaborated and said, why? Because I know that God's called me there. He said, I know that the time and the assignment that I had here is finished and God's calling me to this next stage. He wants me to go there to continue on the work that he has for me. You know, what a beautiful way to live. How many of you could say that, hey, I know I'm exactly where God wants me to be right now. Do you know God that well? Are you spending enough time with him that you know your assignment for this day and age and this season? See, I don't always feel confident in that. And when I see guys like Pastor John who really has that down, man, I stand in awe of that. I'm like, wow. So there's a couple things that really stood out to me in that statement. We got to fan the flame of God that is within us, this great deposit that has been entrusted to us, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That God came and lived a sin, he, he came and lived a sinless life and died in our place for our sins that we might have life and we need to share that message with others. And then he really gives us a way to stand out in the midst of the madness where it said, God gave us not a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Isn't this generation right now kind of characterized by fear? We're afraid to gather together with one another. We're afraid to hang out with the people who are our best friends. We're afraid to get close to each other. They want us to be in fear at every single turn, but God says his is not a spirit of fear. So guess what? Some of this don't come from God for sure because it's all about fear mongering, right? Some of it is not from God. We need to be able to discern. But how amazing would it be if we could walk in power and love and in self-control in a world that shows little of each of those three, right? People would be flocking to you. People at work would be saying, wow, how are you so happy at a time like this? How are you not fearful right now? What is different about you? You wouldn't have to go seek them out to try to share the gospel with them. They'd be coming to you asking you to share with them what is different about you. And the door would open up where you could say, I got God in my life. Jesus saved me. He delivered me. He set me free. I don't live in fear. I walk in power and anointing. Amen? Amen. One person's excited. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. 2 Timothy 2.4. We read this verse at the beginning of this series in the very early days of when we started. It says, no soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. When you're on wartime footing, there's not much time for civilian pursuits. But isn't that what the devil wants to pull us into all the time? He wants to keep you worried about what the Jaguar score is. He wants to keep you worried about all the things that really don't matter all that much, right? He wants to distract us. It's one of his primary tools to keep us from the things that really matter. And if you're anything like me, I fall into those things more often than I know I should. See, what I hope will happen at some point during this message is maybe not at this point, at another point, God's going to use some of the things that you hear to convict you. Because I'm not here to tickle your ears today. I'm here to share with you from God's word and let it do the work that only it could do in your life. If there's a need to change some area in your life, would you be humble enough to allow the Lord to change you this morning, to transform you? As you sense his presence, would you allow him to change you? The day and age we live in is dark, and if we do live in the last days, the time is short, and we each have a job to do and a calling upon our life. We all need to be a lot more like Pastor John and know what we're called to do and be about that. And don't be distracted by the things of this world. Timothy was brave enough to do that in his own generation. In 2 Timothy 2.14, it says, Remind them of these things. And charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no one any good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Those are some important words and instructions. During the season where a lot of us were cooped up at home, I saw a ton of things out there on social media where people would post something about some aspect of doctrine and then all of a sudden they'd be scrapping with other people about it, right? Have you noticed that everybody's a subject matter expert nowadays? I ain't never met so many doctors since COVID came around. 
But we do it in the Bible as well, and we put that out there before others, and there's some danger in that he's talking about. Because half the stuff you're squabbling about don't make no difference, and then guess what? Two believers that love one another are fighting, and then all of a sudden there's a schism between those two, and the devil's the only one that gets the victory. And then if a non-believer is looking on and watching us quarrel, what do you think they think? How much do you think they want to become a Christian or talk to you after they see you fighting about everything? Don't waste your breath on that stuff. Here's the honest truth. God meant one thing in his word. I assure you of that. But guess what? Pastor Eric is going to make some mistakes on certain aspects of doctrine because guess what? I'm human, right? Pastor Andre is going to make some mistakes on various aspects of his doctrine. And guess what? He's human. Doesn't mean God fluctuates. But if we fight over stupid things, what good does that do for the kingdom of God? It does nothing to advance the kingdom of God. Let's focus on first things first. Love one another. Preach the good news of the gospel with all your heart, all your strength, all your soul, all your mind. And get in the word so that you can tell the difference between truth and lies. And you don't always have to defend yourself. Guess what? People are going to say bad stuff about you. Y'all never had nobody say bad stuff about you? People are going to say bad stuff about you. And at the end of the service, you'll see how he deals with that. God will deliver. God will set free. God will judge. He'll take care of those things. Amen. But might we present ourselves to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. May we not fight with one another in Jesus' name. As we move into chapter 3, we get into the heart of what I think God wants to bring us to today. I ask the question again, are we in the last days? Let's read about some of the characteristics of what the last days look like. And then at the end, you can come to that conclusion for yourself. I was going to read the whole thing and then break it down. But I think I'm going to just dive into breaking it down. So if you could put it up on the screen, we'll, we'll do that just to save a minute or two from the reading. It starts in 2 Timothy 3.1. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Has anybody noticed the difficulty is increasing, right? The challenges are increasing. Now, if we're honest, some of the things that we're dealing with are still first world problems, right? So like COVID hit, there was challenges, and y'all couldn't find some toilet paper for a little while, but everything ended up working out okay, right? That's kind of a first world problem. Hallelujah, Jesus. Aren't you glad? Even though toilet paper, like you can't even afford it anymore. But I mean, like times are changing. But some of the problems we're dealing with are, are, are first world problems, but not all of them, right? A lot of things have changed over the past two years. There is a measurable sense of fear amongst many. There's a panic amongst many. We have seen real disruptions of people's lives and we've lost some of the people that are closest to us. These are difficult times, right? And it seems like it may get more difficult as time goes on. The prices seem to be going up, but how many of your paychecks have been going up, right? Right? So the struggle is real in many areas of life. There's difficulties, there's challenges, and there might be more in the days ahead. Number two, people will be lovers of self. Let's be honest. We're the generation that invented the selfie, did we not? Come on, come on now. Man, I would hate to be dating in this day and age because you see all those filters that they got on Instagram and Facebook and all that stuff. Have anybody met anybody like you looked at them for the first time and you'd only seen them on Facebook before and you're like, are you even who that person's talking about? Like what? what or like, uh, am I sure I even know who, none of y'all have seen that kind of stuff? I know you had that moment, right? Like where you're like, what? <laughs> really? God bless all of you who are single. I'm praying for you in Jesus' name right now, right? But let's be honest also. Think, think about the logic of a selfie for just a second, you know. I've seen a lot of people's bathroom gym selfies, you know, and there may or may not be, let's get back to motives for a second, let's, let's just be real. Is your motive when you're posting that to genuinely help other people maybe on their journey towards health? If it is, praise Jesus, go ahead, post those all day, amen. 
Is your motive to have people look at you and say, dang, I worked out today and you didn't? Ha! Jesus, hallelujah, I'm looking good and you not. Then you might need to repent, right? So all these things can be good things. There's nothing wrong with taking a great picture and posting it out there. It's wonderful to see, is it not? When you get those great moments in life that you take of somebody else or yourself, absolutely nothing wrong with that. But it gets down to motive. What is the reason for which you are posting that? Is it to exalt self? Is it to get people to look at you? Is it simply to get likes? If it is, then we need to take that moment to repent because this life isn't all about us. And guess what? We're all going to get old. Same thing like plastic surgery, right? There's real reasons. Sometimes people get it for good reasons. You maybe want to look a little bit better. Amen. But some people are taking it too far. You all know you've seen some people looking like aliens nowadays, right? I mean, like, is it just me or am I being... You all think the things that I do. You're just not willing to say it in front of other people, right? Is that, is that what it is? They will be lovers of money. This is a global problem right now, but we're acutely aware of it at times here in the United States. I think it is one of the biggest issues that we have here in the United States. Um, you know, you, you can hardly see a video that's out there where they're not touting in modern day music the Bentley or the very expensive champagne or the right jewelry or the right clothes. And frankly, you see people flexing all the time, you know. You see people out there putting the things that they own or the things that they do. And that, again, could be a good thing or a bad thing. It's not always a bad thing, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not discounting that. But what is the reason why you're posting that stuff? Is it to really make yourself look good, like, look what I've achieved, look what I've done? Or is it to encourage other people to maybe continue to do good? You know, I like cryptocurrency, but the whole thing in cryptocurrency is win moon, win Lambo, right? Everybody wants it right now. They want to get rich right at this moment. Guess what? Life don't generally work that way. What happened to the old hard work ethic and things like that that we did to continue to advance and help others come alongside of us and grow too? Our lives can't be all about money. I don't really care how much you have. I'd rather know you by how much you give. A lot of y'all said yes, but a lot of y'all even don't tithe. Uh-oh, Eric said it. We're in trouble now. A statement like that sounds really good on the surface, right? Not be known for what you get, but be known for what you give. But how many people are willing to live that way? To give it away, to keep it, to pour it all out and say, hey, guess what? One day I'm going to go to the grave and I ain't taking nothing with me. To give it all away. How amazing would that be? Could that be part of the story of the people of Journey Church? Proud. There's a lot of know-it-alls in today's day and age. You have an opinion about everything, but really don't know a lot about anything. I've been that before, have you? Have you said stuff that you thought you were the genius on and you're really pretty dumb? I know I felt that way a few times in my life, right? We're proud. Lord, remove that from us. Arrogance. The way that many people behave is beyond anything that I've ever seen in our day and age. Abusive, child abuse, sexual abuse, human trafficking, verbal abuse. The way we treat each other online and in person is horrible at times. If these are not at all-time highs, Lord, help us now, right? Lord, would you just come right now? Because if we got to see this stuff get a lot worse, and maybe it will, but guess what? There's hope in what we're going to hear in just a few moments. There's a way that we can live that's different than the world that can stand out and draw people unto Jesus. He adds an interesting one. They're disobedient to their parents. I know I've been guilty of this from time to time. I don't know about you, right? But I've seen in our day and age some extremes when it comes to that. I've heard of counselors that rather than counseling you to try to get better and try to grow closer and try to work out your issues, because guess what? If your family don't have issues, every family has issues. We've all got issues. Are we willing to admit that today? Every family's got issues. And we all have room to change. We all have room to grow. We all have room to, to get better. But it used to be that blood was thicker than water was the old statement, right? And we would do everything that we can to try to keep that together, to reconcile, to grow. But now you actually have counselors in our day who all just call out as being wicked, who are saying, no, guess what? Just cancel your parents out. You don't need to make it better with them. Or cancel your kids out. Or cancel your brother out. Or cancel your sister out. Or whatever it might be, rather than growing together. And let me tell you something, that's part of the scheme of the devil, and why do I say that? Think about how 
you know, Bishop was here earlier. If you, if you know Bishop, great, great man of God. He's in, he's in the back praying. And one of the things he said is, you know, God created them male and female. He created them, right? Think about why the agenda is so big right now on distorting issues of the very gender of who we are and causing us to question that. Because if God created man and woman in his image, right? Man and woman, he created them. His plan from the beginning, the devil's, is to distort what the family is all about. So if he can't do it through that, then guess what? He'll go and use something like economics to do it. Where a few generations ago, say, one person in the house could work and you could be able to have, say, the wife back home taking care of the kids, right? And then now you can't do that in our generation. Everybody has to work so that you could even get by. But then that means we're giving our kids over to somebody else to raise. And guess what? They probably don't raise them as much as we do, no matter what we feel about it, no matter what we say. They're not going to be the same as we are, are they? So we entrust the Lord those kinds of situations, right? We entrust that he'll care for them, cover them, watch over them, be there for them. But maybe that's not the way that it was supposed to be, right? But why do we accept all these things as true? Why do we just flow with it? Why do we just accept it? When the devil uses those cracks and those schisms to get in, he'll divide the family in whatever way he can. He cannot get the victory in Jesus' name. Ungrateful is the next one. No offense to the millennials or any other generation. I'm not stereotyping anybody because I've seen it a lot. There's a huge entitlement mentality in our generation. Guess what? You are entitled to nothing good from God. We are sinners who deserve nothing but death, right? We deserve judgment, and by God's grace, he does not judge us. He covers that sin and welcomes us into his family. We should not expect to be entitled to anything, What you deserve is death. What I deserve is death. We deserve judgment, but God is so gracious and so good that he loves us and cares for us. Unholy is the next word that it says. People have no reverence for God in our generation. I can recall even as an unbeliever, I still had some tinge of something in my head that I was not going to make fun or mock Jesus or mock Christianity because if he was the real God, I didn't want him to zap me in Jesus' name, right? But today, they're bold enough to go out there and even make things like shoes with real human blood that honor Satan. And people go out there and buy them for $1,000 a piece. There's no shame left in our generation. This is the world we live in in our day and age. Heartless. People don't care. They'll shoot you for five bucks. Unappeasable. You could speak the truth to them. You could show them the video. You could show them the original scene of how it really went right, and they will still deny whatever happened in our generation. Am I lying about any of this just yet? Right? Like, y'all, y'all tracking with me? Slanderous. Right? Slanderous. I think regardless of politics, discount politics for a minute, but I think probably everyone would agree. I, rem- I think it was Justice Kavanaugh for the Supreme Court not long ago. Uh, and they were accusing, there was a lady that was accusing him and maybe others, but they really made it political to the point that they slandered the guy to death, said like made him out to be a demon. He's the worst human being ever to live. There's no way he should be a Supreme Court justice. And if that were true, right, you know, when, the, uh, when he got elected and finally went in there, I would think that the efforts to do that would continue because if you were really a bad guy and it was really about him being a bad guy, you should persist with those claims. But guess what? The claims didn't persist after that. The day that he got in, all of a sudden, all the accusations completely disappeared. Think about the woman. What if this was true? They discounted and discarded that woman like she was dirty laundry. You don't hear one more word about the lady who was supposedly the accuser of that particular situation. If you really care for somebody, aren't you loving on them, caring for them, being there for them if they were really abused? So they're willing to slander people for a political agenda and advancement. It's not just in that area. In almost every area of life, we see people willing to slander others so that they can get ahead. Without self-control, drugs, alcoholism, gluttony. Eric, did you have to say gluttony? Um... Even controlling one's emotions are all gone. Brutal, not loving good. People literally calling what is evil good and good evil when it shouldn't be. That's the kind of day and age that we live in, right? Treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. 
America is the leading purveyor of porn to the world. And you know, half the things that I've talked about, the statistics are no different between Christians and non-Christians. Almost every one of these are equal amongst both groups. Something has to change, right? Something needs to happen differently. You're like, man, I wish I didn't come to church this morning. <laughs> Here's the one I'm going to focus on. We're almost to the end. Having the appearance of godliness but denying its power, avoid such people. What's the danger in that? There's a lot of good, well-believing, Bible-believing Christians that deny the power of God in our generation. That say that God does still not move, God doesn't heal, God doesn't deliver. Anything supernatural having to do with the supernatural as it pertains to God, deliverance from demonic powers, supernatural healing, you name it. They want to deny all of those things. Why does he go so far as to say, avoid such people? That's a pretty strong statement, is it not? Here's my thoughts on it. Um, you can't fight supernatural things, right, with natural things. You will lose every time. So isn't it just like the devil to put a grand deceit on the body of Christ to discount anything supernatural? Because he knows that if he discounts everything supernatural and then you're only combating it by natural means, you're going to get whooped up on all the time. So he tells him explicitly, stay away from that kind of logic. Stay away from that kind of thinking. If you want to defeat the devil, guess what? It's going to take some supernatural anointing. It's going to take some supernatural power to overcome the power of the demonic in your life. And in fact, next week, I'm going to be preaching a message between the difference between deliverance and healing. I think it's going to be a great message. I encourage you to come back and bring somebody with you. It's going to be a really good one. But man, we need the power and the presence of God more now than ever before. For among them are those who creep into households, capture weak women, burden with sins, and lead them astray for various passions. The first thing that kept, came to mind was the sex trafficking industry. Number seven, always learning and never able to arrive at the knowledge of the truth. We live in a day and age where you could learn anything on YouTube, anything on the internet, but we have these sensors that maybe are trying to not even actually get us to come to the place of truth. Whenever you have a ministry of truth in a country, guess what? They're probably lying. Think about that for a minute. Remember when Iraq was about to fall, if you're old enough to remember that? One of the big, they had Baghdad Bob. Anybody remember that? Nobody remembers Baghdad Bob? You got to go research that, right? Baghdad Bob was the guy that got up there and supposedly was telling everybody the truth about what the situation was, but every word was a lie out of his mouth. And he was the head of the ministry of truth, right? Aren't we to that place in politics today? <laughs> Am I the only one laughing about that? I mean, like, that is literally the place that we're at today, right? Everything is a lie. We live in a day and age where the father of all lies seems firmly, firmly in control of the things of the world, right? And this could discourage all of us if we ended right there. Be like, man, you're right. So having said all those things, do you believe we're in the last days or not? Do you believe that we're in a time and a season where Jesus is coming soon to crack the eastern sky? If you do, then guess what? There's some things that we should be doing, right? There's some things that God calls us to do. If the time is truly short and none of us are guaranteed tomorrow, we better live like he's coming back today, right? There's people that need to be reached with the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in our generation. As we move on, 2 Timothy 3.8. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so the men also oppose the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far for their folly will be plain to all as it was for those two men. Guess what? For all the craziness and lies that we see, God's going to judge it all. We don't have to worry about a lot of it. All we need to do is continue preaching the truth, continue loving others, continue serving others, continue being there for others, and God will ultimately get the victory and we will get to see it, right? And God will take the darkness and make it go away and the light will shine on those things. They will get busted. They will get disgusted. And God will work it all out in the end. Amen. Amen. Paul gives P Timothy some final charges in 2 Timothy 4.1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is judge of the living and the dead, and by the appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Church, do you know the word? 
Are you in the word? Even more importantly, are you spending time with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords so you can tell the difference between truth and falsehood? Do you know him enough? Are you intimate with him enough? If you're not, man, start today. You know, may we not be passionate about the kinds of things that the world is passionate about. Might we be passionate about our relationship with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who loves you and died for you? Lord, stir that kind of passion in our heart. He gives one final caution for our generation. For the time has come when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears They will accumulate for themselves teachers who suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. I think we see a little bit of that in our own generation as well. But here's what I'm determined to do. Journey, I don't want any of us to be casualties of war. I want us to know the truth, walk in the truth, live the truth, love one another, care for one another, be there for one another, all the things that I've shared today. And man, I want you to be an overcomer. Fear is not of the devil and it's gripped so many. I mean, fear is not of God. It is of the devil, right? Fear is not of the Lord and he's gripped us and paralyzed us in this generation. And man, it is not meant to be so. We can walk in a very different way. Would you rise with me? Would you bow your heads? And close your eyes today. Scripture says, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of the evangelist, fulfill your ministry, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Father, as we come to the conclusion of our time together today, I thank you for being present in our midst. Lord, we got to spend a wonderful time exalting you, celebrating joyful praise, Lord Jesus. I know today's message might have been a bit convicting in various ways, and Lord, that is okay. We're not looking to garner ourselves preachers for itching ears that will only lead us towards our passions. Lord, we want to know the truth of your word, every aspect of it, the tough moments, the great moments, and all the moments in between, Lord God. And Father, where we need conviction and repentance in light of today's message, Lord, would you put it on our heart to lay those things down at your feet before we walk out of here? that we could walk out of here our burdens a little bit lighter, that we could walk out of here having drawn closer to you or maybe drawn close to you for the very first time in our lives. So I would ask you today, have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Is he your Lord and King? If he's not, there's no better moment than now to say, Jesus, I believe you are who you say you are and I surrender my life to you. There's still yet others who might be in this room. You are believers in Jesus Christ, but you know there's some things that you've got to let go of, and you're ready to have your passion stored towards him today to fully serve him, fully live for him, and you're ready to let some things go so you can do just that. If you're of either of those two groups, I'd love to pray for you right here, right now, where you're at with nobody looking around. Is today a day that you need to dedicate or rededicate your life to the Lord? If it is, would you do me a favor and just raise your hand up real high right where you're at? And I'll be glad to pray for you. Is there anybody here today? I see your hand, sir. Are there others? It's a little dark. I see your hand back there. Thank you, Lord. I see your hand over here and yours. Thank you, gentlemen. Hallelujah, Jesus. God still moves. God still heals. God still delivers. God still sets free. And Father, we come to you today and acknowledge you for who you are, the king of the universe, who sent your one and only begotten son to be born of a virgin and live a sinless life and then die a sinner's death in our place for our sins. And whether you're saying this prayer for the first time or whether you're doing it by means of reaffirmation, I ask you to just live it today. That, Lord, we believe all of those things, that you are the son of the living God who died on a cross and rose again, that we might have life that your, our sins can be forgiven and washed away and we could be made white as snow. So today we come before you and thank you for that, Lord Jesus. 
We thank you for the deliverance that comes in being a part of your family. We thank you that the blood does make us whole and makes us clean and changes our hearts and changes our mind. And Holy Spirit, your word says that you will endue us from on high when we get saved. And I invite the Holy Spirit right now into my life in a new and greater measure. Remove all things out of my life that hinder your presence from being in my life. So as we lay down our sins, Holy Spirit, fill us with your presence. Fill us with your power. Fill us with your glory and empower us to live a holy and God-filled life, one that seeks after you at every turn, seeks to expand the kingdom of God, that we would know what our assignments are in you and that we would live them out, that you would be our whole desire and our passion, that we would not be intrigued by the things of this world, but we would be set on fire, that you, O Lord, this very moment by the power of the Holy Spirit would fan the flames of the Holy Spirit in our life, that we could live for you from this moment forward and into eternity, and that we get to bring a lot of people along with us in Jesus' mighty and glorious name. Amen, amen, and amen. Give God a little glory today. I would encourage you to do this before you leave. If you need prayer, some of our prayer team is going to be up here in the front. They would love to pray for you. Don't leave here without getting prayer. If you prayed for that prayer for the first time, would you come up and join hands with one of them? They'd love to give you a little bit more information on how you can start your walk off with Christ in a great way. And uh, I think many of our small group leaders are heading to the back now. If you want to, please follow them to the back. Get plugged in, get connected, get in a small group where you can grow in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Have a wonderful